Now, before we get started this morning, in uh, the uh, as we conclude this series, does heaven know you? I just want you to pay attention to your uh, spiritual and to well. Let me make it very simple for you. I want you to pay attention to your countenance, to your attitude. And to how you feel and what you sense. Now, I don't want you to just do it today. I want you to start doing this now from now on. Because what happens is what's going on in the world, the spirit of it, will begin to affect your attitude. Huh? The spirit of the world will affect your attitude. which, And if it affects your attitude, it will affect your praise. It'll affect your countenance, and if it affects your uh, per- persona, then it'll affect your praise. It'll affect your worship. You know how I know this? Fifty years of being in the church, and people come in one week uh, sky high, and they come in the next week down. They come in one week ready to praise, and see, they come in the next week, and you couldn't squeeze a praise word out of them no matter how hard you squeezed them. They come in one week, and they look like they've been eating lemons. They come in the next week, man, they got a big smile on their face. Pay attention to what's going on in the world and determine in yourself if it's affecting you. See, today is St. Patty's Day, and the world is worshiping. They're celebrating. Did it rob you of your celebration of the king? Yeah, it did. Hmm? It can. Huh? Here's, here's the thing. Is my praise at a 10 today or is my praise at a 2 today? And why is it at a 2 instead of a 10? I'm just asking you, uh, with especially those of you have gone, who are going through and have gone through SOCI and have gone through our Tuesday night classes of lay ministry, this is something when the Word talks about discerning of spirits, this is one of the first things He teaches you to do in discerning of spirits. What spirit is affecting your attitude? What a spirit is affecting your praise? Why are you down? Why are you not up? Why are you discouraged? Why are you disappointed? Why are you excited? Why, only you can determine where you are and what, and what brought you to that. Amen? Recognize that about the world, about the spirit of the world. I know this is kind of off cuff, but I want you, but the Holy Spirit would say to you, recognize this about how the world does things, and I'll show you, and, and how the spirit of the world affects us. Amen. Uh, I can tell the difference whenever I come in here and I haven't prayed in the spirit, and I can tell the difference of when I do come in here and I have been praying in spirit. I can tell the difference when I've been pursuing the Lord throughout the week and when I've come in here and I've been on and I haven't been pursuing him at all. See, I can, I can tell the difference. The difference is not with him. The difference is in me. Amen? So pay attention because what we're bringing you to is a place of spiritual maturity. Why? Because of the triangle of light. And we used to be Many of us, we'd be on the fringes, and now the fringes is out in darkness, and we want to get as close to the middle as we possibly can. So be aware because the deceiving spirits are out to deceive the saints, which is why the Word says that God speaking said that he would shorten the time lest the very elect be deceived. Pay attention to your, pay attention to your soul. Pay attention to what gets you up and what gets you down. Pay attention. Why am I like that? I remember when I started engaging the Holy Spirit and inviting him into teaching me in the area of my emotions, all of a sudden my life began to change incrementally little little by little. Amen? So grab hold of that. Now, I'm not going to charge you that for anything for that at all. Now, we've been asking and answering the question. By the way, that was a training moment. Let's get to teaching now. We've been answering the question, does heaven know you? We've been asking other questions like, are there strangers in heaven? What does heaven say about you? What does heaven say about you? Well, if you've been in this series, you, you, know, uh, you know 
that 1 Thessalonians 5.23 is a prayer. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul was pointing this out to us, that you are, you and I are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a body. Now, each, all three parts of our being and why God created us to be that way is so that we could have a physical experience. He gave us a soul so we could have a soulish experience. And he gave us a spirit so that we can have a spiritual experience. Not in the sweet by and by, but in the rotten here and now. Amen? Now, each one of these parts of our three-part being has its own unique reservoir, power, energy, strength. But most people treat this as the primary when right here is the dynamo. This is the dynamo of your three-part being. And we've shown you this in, throughout Scripture. Your spirit, man, is the only place that you can accumulate faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. The only thing that justifies me and justifies you in the sight of God is that you live by faith every day. That's the only thing that separates us from them. We're justified, and they're not justified. And the only difference is that you're justified because every day you live by faith. That's it. It's that simple. But faith does not live here or accumulate here or here. Faith accumulates here, and it moves mountains. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? So here in our spirit, man, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's within reach. Oh, the kingdom of heaven is a long way from this. It's a long way from the soul. But it's within reach. It's at hand right here. And your spirit man can just reach over here. And what grace is made available, faith takes it. This is the supernatural power of God, and you can bring his power into your spirit and from your spirit through this two-way door called your soul into your physical realm, or you can bring it into your soul to bring healing to your soul and wholeness to your emotions that's been bruised and battered. Amen? So I want you to grab hold of this. Jesus knew what he was talking about. It's right here. And all I have to do is reach over there with my faith. And bring it over into my spirit, man. Amen? Now, so here you and I are a three-part being, and we've said throughout this series, if we would just give equal attention, maybe not even equal, but if we would just give a little more attention than we have to our spirit than we do our physical and soul, wonder what kind of trajectory of growth we would find ourselves in. It would just, we, we, we would just take off. Amen? Now, here's what we learned last week as Paul was teaching us out of 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. When he told us, because, see, when I read through the Word, I'm always looking for alignment. Alignment. It has to come in sequence to completion, okay, to fullness. So we found that Paul is teaching us that when we pray in the Spirit, our mind is unfruitful. We suspend our thought life. And so we've said throughout this series, there are times, in fact, one of the first sessions we taught, we talked about how when God speaks to us like we're praying, and you need to know this, when you pray, it is never a monologue. It is always a dialogue. God is always speaking back to you. He is never silent. It is not a monologue. It is not a one-way conversation. He is speaking whether you hear him or not. He is speaking. This is a dialogue. Huh? Now grab hold of this. If we pray with our mind first, then what happens is we start having question marks. Is that God? Is he talking to me? Did he tell me to do that? I don't know. I'm not sure. Should I do that or shouldn't I? I'm not sure that, did I hear him correctly? See, when we pray with our mind, Paul taught us first, then we get question marks. But when we pray in the Spirit, until our mind is unfruitful, until our, our thoughts are suspended and it's no longer talking back to us, 
Pray in the Spirit. If you know how to pray in the Spirit, pray. I had somebody walk up to me the other day, and they said, it's always awkward when I'm with people and we all praying in the Spirit. And he said, can you tell me what that is? I said, yeah, it's pride. It's real simple. It's just pride. Because the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusteth against the flesh. The flesh doesn't want to do what the Spirit wants it to do. See? you got to deal with it. There's just a lot of religious thinking in the church, in this church. Still. Still, I'm sorry. It just is. And that's this church. Are you listening? I'm, we're going to kill some sacred cows. In my understanding, it makes the best hamburger patties. Huh? Makes the best steaks. Religious thinking. People have traded religious thinking for what they think is the word. It's not the word. Are you listening? I'm on a tangent this morning for some reason. The Holy Spirit has lit a fire under me for some reason. So look at how what Paul said. He said, no, pray in the Spirit until your mind is unfruitful. Now, when you do that, once your brain, once your intellect goes silent and you've suspended your thoughts, now begin to pray out of your mind. What will happen is you will immediately hear the Holy Spirit speak back to you. He'll tell you. But now how does faith come? By hearing. Now that he says something to you, faith accompanied it. But now where's he speaking to you? Right here in your spirit, man. And you'll say, like I said this last week, and you'll say, oh, you, oh, that's you, Holy Spirit. See, you're acknowledging him. You don't acknowledge him in here. You acknowledge him with your mouth. Same way you acknowledge him when you receive salvation. Oh, that's you, Holy Spirit. And he'll tell you to do something, and you'll say, and it seems a little risky, or it seems like it's a little out there, and you'll go, okay, you'll go, okay. Okay, I'll do that simply because you told me to do it. Why? Because faith rose up on the inside of you. Now there is no question mark. If question mark starts stops faith, then faith stops the question mark. Have that faith rise up on the inside of you when he speaks that word to you. And then just say, I'll do that because you told me to. Or whatever instruction he gives you, he, he, you, you say to him, oh, you are directing me to do this? I will do it. I'll do it and then do it. Amen? Where does it all start? Right here with the Spirit. If we could just get this in our thinking, it is the Spirit. After that, the soul and the physical. Treat that Spirit man as the dynamo it is, as the powerhouse that it is. If you, will, if you will put it as having authority in your life over the other two parts of your being, you'll be amazed at what kind of results you get and what kind of things you'll prevent from happening in your life. Amen? You get anything out of this? I'm, let's go. Amen. Now, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, you've been here throughout this series, and so because of that, you're ready. You're ready for what you're about to hear. Say, I'm ready. ready. Say it like you mean it. There you go. You know this. God created the earth. And then he turned to humanity and he said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, and subdue it. Subdue the earth. I want you to think about all that the earth, all that this creation by God provides for you. Who created the earth? God. And I want you to think about all that this earth gives you air water poultry beef fish steel iron precious metals fruits grains think about what the earth that is God through creation 
putting both hands out to you and saying, I'm giving this to you. I'm giving this to you. Everything you drive and, every, and the house that you live in was created by the materials of this earth. Who created this earth and who gave this earth to you? God, he's given with both hands. And we, act like he, and we act like the only time he gives us something is when he answers our prayer. He gives them to us every day. Huh? This earth is his creation. And think of how many generations of people throughout history he's given to, given to, given to. And they've never given him one ounce of credit. And even when they sit down and have a meal, they don't even pray over it, giving him thanks for it. And then when something bad happens to them, who's the first thing they who's the first person they blame? Somebody other than themselves. Huh? Most of the time, God. God is not the taker, God is the giver. He is the giver. And when Adam fell in the garden, what did God do? He gave his only, he gave his greatest gift, his only son. Here he is once again, given with both hands to humanity. So that, because he's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. So at least in that situation, God gave us a choice. Whether we make the choice for him or not, at least he gave us the choice. This, again, is God giving to us. See, he's a giver, not a taker. Amen. Say, I'm ready. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 with that in mind. Let's look at this. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Is God, does God give the increase? Does God ever give decrease? Does it put a smile on God's face when you decrease? Does he ever put you in a situation where you decrease? No. Because God is the increaser. Say this after me. God is the increaser. God is the increaser. Amen. So notice how increase is correlated with something sown and something watered. In other words, something has to be sown by a person and then something has to be watered by a person, but even then, still, it is God who gives the increase. And so, the reason this is important is because, see, God doesn't multiply nothing. I know that's two negatives. God doesn't multiply nothing. This isn't witchcraft. This isn't trickery or illusion. This is not magic. Zero times a thousand is still zero. And so Paul said, I can't give increase. Apollos can't give increase. Only God can give increase. And so do you understand I can't increase me, and you can't increase you. Only God can increase you. If you'll settle this, it'll change your life. Amen. Now, look at this next verse. It validates what I'm saying. Oh, well, before you do, you can bring that up. But as I'm doing this, I, I, want you to, I want you to hear me out here. If we truly believe that God is the increaser, we would probably treat him better. If I can't get any increase in my own ability, if I can, I can sow all day, I can plant all day, I can water all day, but I cannot give me increase. Only God can give me increase then I would probably treat him diff uh, differently than I am. Huh? I found out to, uh, I found out that we live at a time where there's a misunderstanding and a wrong definition of faith. Much of what the church teaches as faith, people take it as building faith in oneself. 
This is why we'll take a scripture like I can do all things through Christ who gives us me strength, and they'll take it and say, I can do all things. See, they're building faith in themselves. But you're either building faith in yourself or you're building faith in God, period. And never, never the two shall meet because they're at odds with one another. They're not allies. Are you grabbing hold of this? And much of what Christians call faith today is nothing more than the world's definition of faith. They've just built competence in themselves. And when they go to counseling and therapy, and I love Christian therapists, and I know their approach is different, but when they go to counseling and therapy, it's all about giving them confidence to overcome that in their own ability. They're building faith in themselves. But do you see, I've had people over the years say, well, you know, you don't understand. You know, I'm, I'm intellectual. I'm smart. I have wit. Or I have street smarts. You don't understand. I got where I am because I have a great work ethic. Or I'm just a hard worker. Yeah, uh-huh. And who gave you that ability? See, you're not so smart after all, are you? He's the one that gave you those smarts. See, he's the great giver. He is the, he's the increaser. He's the one that gives increase. He's the one that gives you the ability to get, get up out of bed and go down there and do the hard work that you do. Without that, you couldn't do it. See, if we truly believe this, we would treat him better. God is the great increaser. Now, this scripture validates it. So neither is he that planteth anything. That ought to make us feel warm and fuzzy. Or he that watereth nothing, but God that giveth the increase. Do you see it? I'm nothing because I can't increase me. I can sow. I can water what I sow. But I still can't bring increase to my life. Only God can give me the increase. My spiritual father taught me this 30 years ago. He taught me the, the, the truth about God being the giver, the increaser. And he said, you can't do anything about it. If you get increase or you get promotion, it's only because God did it. Amen? Well, that settled it for me. Now, see, a farmer understands what I'm talking about. Because, see, a, a farmer, the reason they plant is why? For increase. And the reason they go to such extent to get water to what those seeds they sowed is for what? Increase. That should be the reason why you plant, why you sow, and why you water what you sow is for increase. But it's still God that gives the increase. Now, what I got from this that really touched me more than anything else was that this is an invitation by God to participate with him in supernatural increase. I'm not talking about increase, normal increase, uh, increase that happens just by, you know, the sweat of your brow. I'm talking about supernatural increase that's a sweatless anointing. Amen? Where you no longer limit yourself to one thing because, you know, this is what you do. But you open up the 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 channels and you let God do it however he wants to because he's the one that increases you amen say God is the increaser and I'm going to treat you better <laughs> hallelujah amen now how do we treat him the way he should be treated well let's go back to what we've uh, introduced in this series, not chapter of Proverbs, verse 10. I'm just going to quote it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's what this whole series has been about. 
This series is just the beginning of knowledge. That's all it is. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a deep root. You're going to go all the way back to the beginning of knowledge? You're going to have to dig deep. There's a lot of Christians, a lot of spiritual leaders that don't want to dig that deep. It's so much easier to live right up here on the surface and teach people about surface things because this appeals to them. But it's the deepness of this root, the beginning of knowledge. That's what this whole series has been about. The beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, in in many ways, churches and Christianity has taken the fear of the Lord and they have, I'm going to use the phrase, dumbed it down to its honor, its respect, and reverence. But there's a difference between honor, respect, and reverence and true honor, true respect, and true reverence. And the only way that true, see, so people think, I'll just muster up honor for God. You can't muster that up. I'll just muster up my respect for God. My reverence for him. You can't do it. Even when you're on a even when you're on cloud nine spiritually, you can't muster, muster up that honor. Only an encounter with God's power can produce true honor. You don't believe me. Only an experience with God's presence can produce true reverence and true respect. You know that, um, no, I'm not going to get off there. Only an encounter with God's hand can produce the fear of the Lord. And so this is why he's called you into this. So this is why he's called us to participate with him and to have a transactional relationship with him because he wants you to build your faith, not in you, but to build your faith on his power. Why? Because that's unshakable. That's an unshakable foundation. You won't be moved. Amen? When you honor God that way, how many know? How many know? So the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge. How many know fear is an emotion? Have you ever experienced God in such a way that it touched your emotion? It hit you emotionally, and all of a sudden you step back in awe. You were awestruck, or you couldn't speak, or whatever happened after that. And when it occurred, you went, "Oh, God!" I'm talking about that kind of experience. I'm talking about those kind of encounters. And yet God has called us to participate with him, to have those kind of experiences with him. Why? So that we can truly honor him. Huh? Fear is an emotion. You'll know, you'll know that you've encountered God that way because your emotions will validate it and say, yep, you just had an experience with the power of God. You just had an experience with the presence of God. Amen. And there's nothing this side of heaven that's greater. Nothing. Now, why is this important? Because you can't separate increase from honor. It requires an honor for him in order for the increase you're coming to increase you. You can't separate increase from honor. Amen. You know, there's something worse than dying. It's called dying without God. And then finding, uh, that person finding themselves in hell, recognizing that the situation that they're in is for eternity. This is why this, to me, is so important because I recognize that there are different groups of people on different places on this path and and so I'm teaching to a a, a a wide group of various groups of people within this church amen and because of the depth of it you have to reach over into and help each group separately and this and the Holy Spirit knows exactly who's here today amen 
and his teaching. I've had people over the years come up to me and said, you said this during your session today. And I went, I did? See, because it wasn't anything that I pre-planned in my intellect to say. But see, they heard something I didn't even hear, but it came out of my mouth. Who did it come from? It came from the Holy Spirit. What, what, what did they hear? What they needed to hear. The Holy Spirit was speaking specifically to them. And then there are you, those of you who you're there and you're HSP, so you're a highly sensitive person. And so the, as I'm speaking to you, the Holy Spirit is filling in blanks. And it's not even anything I'm saying. It's what he's saying to you directly as I'm talking. How do I know this? Because I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit as I'm sitting here talking to you. This relationship with the Holy Spirit is a dialogue. It is never a monologue. And religious tradition has told us, no, it's just a, it's a one way. And if you ever hear from God, ooh, consider that a victory lap. No. This should be something normal and common in our lives. We should be hearing because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. To know it, to know his voice means you hear him often enough to know him. Now, I want to show you today in Scripture a recorded event that happened in Jesus' ministry that shows you what honor looks like. You can do with it what you want to. We're going to look at it in the 14th chapter of Mark, and then we'll look at John's account, record account of it. Now notice in the 14th chapter, look at this. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. So here is Simon. He's been healed of leprosy through the healing ministry of Jesus. And so now he's no longer having to live in a leper colony. He's back home with his family, with his children, with his wife. He's able to live a normal life all because Jesus healed him. Amen? So here he is, and he's invited the disciples, and he's invited some friends over. And they're sitting at the table having a meal. And so there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were, there were, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? So let me, let me give you a little backstory of this woman. This woman has brought a gift to Jesus. She's not going to come and, and sit down and have a meal with Jesus and not bring a gift. But she doesn't just bring something that you could find at the dollar store. Huh? No, she brings this alabaster box full of ointment, and this ointment is very, very valuable. And she comes in, and she breaks that box. Look how beautiful that box is, bejeweled, just like this. And she broke that box because what's in it, this ointment is even more precious than the box itself. And she begins to, they've already taken Jesus' coat off, and so they, she begins to pour this ointment and begin to anoint Jesus and, and, and started with his head. And many people think that Jesus had long hair, so this is a long way that she's anointing him and, and pouring this ointment on him, and it's running over his shoulders and down his chest and down his back. Now, as she goes through this process, it's going to take her some time, maybe an hour, maybe a little over an hour, and she's going to eventually get to the point where she's bathing his legs with tears and ointment, and she's bathing his legs with her hair. And here she is, and she's worshiping him. This is something she's doing out of her heart. She's brought this gift, and she's doing all this out of her heart. And what's happening? You got these, these, these slicks over here, and indignation is rose up in them. And they're saying, whispering, why, why was this waste of the ointment made? Hold on. These are the disciples. Why are they wasting this? Look at what it said in verse 5. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. So now they're no longer just whispering. They're actually full voice gripping at her. Hold on. She's bathing Jesus. With ointment. 
and their full voice griping at her. 300 pence. Theologians tells us that's 300 days of wages. It also tells us that's $30,000 for this alabaster box and this ointment. Now, there's nothing she can do. She's already broke the box. She can't scoop everything back up, put it back in the box, put tape around it. We don't even know if they had tape back then. Huh? There's nothing she can do. And so here they are. What a waste. I can't believe they're wasting that. That's a lot of money. What a waste. And many Christians say the same thing. Many Christians say the very same thing. Now look at what it said. Look at, look at this next verse. This is John's rendition of what he heard and saw. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And this is what we hear people say. See, I've been in church all my life. My dad became a pastor when I was nine years old. And here's what the disciples, here's what these disciples were saying. They were saying, you know, we could have taken that, sold that, and we could have helped the homeless. We could have fed the poor with that money. We could have bought coats for kids. We could have bought them gloves and socks. Cold weather's coming now. What a waste. What a waste. Amen. I've heard people over the years, you know, I, you know, my dad being a pastor, he, he pastored small churches for the most part, 100. Sometimes his churches, his church would be 450 or so people. But I've also been a part of ministries that were big ministries, wealthy ministries, big budgets, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. But, you know, the people are always the same. That just makes me sick, what they're spending on that new building down there at that church. That just makes me sick, what that, the, car, the car that preacher drives down there. I just can't believe it. And when we were at Kenneth Coleman, that just makes me sick, that big old jet he just bought and all the millions of dollars it cost. Yeah, but they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be concerned one bit if the money went to the poor. Listen to what G, listen listen to what this story is teaching us here. I can't believe how Scott dresses down there. <laughs> that preacher, who does he think he is? Well, obviously something you're not. And that watch he wears around his wrist. Now you're talking. I'm fixing to get some bling now. And they'll get to gripping, and they'll get to complain. Who was it in Scripture that says we could have sold that for thirty thousand dollars, and we could have given to the poor? Who 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 said that? No, nah, Judas. Judas said that, not Jesus. In fact, do we think like Judas, or do we think like Jesus? See, I, I've asked this question over the years to a lot of different Christians, and the, the answer is always the same. Oh, that's Jesus that said that. No, he didn't. That's Judas who said that just a few hours before he goes to the religious leaders and betrays Jesus and sells him out for 30 pieces of silver, which is equivalent to $300. And he's so Judas is so hot, he's so mad, he's so angry that this ointment is being wasted. His words, not mine, and he's mad, and he's indignant, and he's like a volcano going off on the inside of himself. And he said, why did we take that money? Why didn't we take that and go down and sell it so we could feed the poor, help the poor? That wasn't Jesus, that was Judas. Jesus said very little about the poor. Very little. You know the one thing Jesus did say? They'll always be with you. 
And you know what else he said? And you'll never be able to meet their needs. That's what he said. But what this does is it brings something to the surface that a lot of Christians don't think about. Do we think like Judas or do we think like Jesus? Huh? What is this about anyway? Really? Because, uh, you know, Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is why I say a lot of what people consider the word is nothing more than religious thinking, even in the church, even in the charismatic church, even in word of faith church, even today. They still think like Judas instead of like Jesus. What way do you think? Huh? What is this all about anyway? Why is this event recorded in Scripture? And this is the first time in 25 years I've ever taught on this event. And the Holy Spirit told me. Missy told me about it. And I started reading, and the Holy Spirit said, you got to teach that in this series as a conclusion. I said, okay. And so what is this about? It's about a value system. What value system do you serve? Because the world could care less about Jesus. The world system does not like the church, does not like Christianity. The value, why would I want to share in a value system that's been served by Judas? Then I better know what I, I better know that value system. And I better know the kingdom of God's value system. And not mix and blend and think, and the answer be, oh, that was Jesus that said that, and you don't even know what you're talking about. Now, if we were in other churches in this city, Everyone in the crowd would have said Jesus. If your toes are hurting, you can blame that on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but this is one of those things. They're, they, this, they're not just mad. They're indignant. I don't know if you've, have you ever felt indignation? I mean, it's like a volcano going off on the inside of you. And that's the way they are about this lady. And all she's doing is worshiping Jesus and bringing him a gift. And they're murmuring and complaining. And again, what is it all about? It's about a value system. This world does not like the church. It does not value the church. It does not value the kingdom of God. They wouldn't give a dime to the church. But they're out there feeding the poor, and they think they're doing something honorable. There is no honor in that. I'm going to show you in Scripture. I I hinted to it last week. God said, for every dollar you give to the poor, I'll give you a dollar back. But he said, for every dollar you give to the kingdom of God, I'll give you a hundredfold return. This is how he values it. This is how he values it. But see, you should have known, see, uh, you, you should have known when the world got a hold of this philanthropy and when they got a hold of, you know, uh, food banks and all that, which should have been the church. I, I don't deny that. But when they started doing that, you should have known right there something's happening. The enemies got involved. Are you listening? The truth is this. There's enough that this creation called the earth is giving every day that every person on this earth, all seven and a half billion people, would, la- would be lavishly living in wealth and abundance except for the brutes who are at the top under the influence of mammon and under the influence of fear governing where that money goes. You care where that money goes? Take your hands off of it. 
There's enough for everybody. But they've chosen to squeeze it down and bottleneck it. That's Satan. That's the influence of Satan that does that. Amen. Look at this next verse. Because I want you to see, I want you to see what Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. Here's how I here's how I know that the world does not like the church. He is despised, speaking of Jesus, and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Does that bother you? Does that bother you that humanity treated him like that? He is our king. He is our savior. He is our Lord. He redeemed us. And they treat him like that? Look at the Amplified Version. Notice what he said, a little more uh, imagery here in this next translation. He was despised and rejected, forsaken by who? A man of sorrows and pains and acquainted with grief and sickness. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we did not appreciate his worth or have any esteem for him. Did Judas appreciate Jesus' worth? Why do people hide their faces from other people? Because they're ashamed how they treated them. They didn't want to look on Jesus because they were ashamed how he was being treated. They knew. They, was, they had a conviction on the, inside of their, on the inside of their consciousness. They knew that they were treating him wrong. Falsely accused him. And yet they followed, they followed through with it anyway. Does this bother you? And if it doesn't, why not? Look at this next translation. He was despised and rejected by people. He was a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering. He was despised like no one from whom people turned their faces, and we didn't consider him to be worth anything. This is how they treated him. Huh? What was this all? What were they saying? When she's pouring this ointment on Jesus and bathing him in these, this oil and her tears and wiping him down with her hair and she's worshiping, what were they saying? What were the disciples saying? See, Judas has, has whispered enough to gal get some of the disciples to jump in there with him and gri- in a gripe session. Who? Judas who was the treasury of Jesus' ministry, and he was over the outreach of Jesus' ministry, outreach to the poor. Do you think the poor was getting anything? (laughs) You kidding me? No. Judas had an addiction. More than one. One of them was a gambling addiction. He was taking all the money and just giving them scraps. And this is the truth. If you think like Judas, that's what you'll be doing, scraping for the scraps instead of living in the abundance, being able to lavishly give to others. And there's so many Christians like that. They're scraping for scraps. Because what? You can't separate increase from honor. You can't do it. Amen? Am I going to honor the world system or value system, or am I going to honor the kingdom of God system and value it? See? I have to ask myself that question. Now, here they are, and they're saying, Jesus, you aren't worth the $30,000. That this woman has gifted you. Now it has. No, now, it, it, see, they think because they're a part of his ministry that that gift that she's bestowing upon him should have gone to them too. Uh, there's something wrong with it. Amen. Now you know what? They don't even know what's about to happen, but this woman is actually preparing Jesus for his burial. The disciples don't know this. The people there don't know this. She doesn't even know it. She's preparing him for his burial. And here they are. Here she is bathing him in this ointment, preparing him without knowing that this is what she's doing. 
and she's and she's saying to him, Lord, I love you. She's not just she's not just going through the she's worshiping him with her with her with her words, with her voice. Lord, I love you. Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for bringing me out. Thank you for cleansing my inner world. I used to be so, so sick on the inside of me. But you cleansed me. And now I feel completely different about myself. I used to hate, hate my soul, my emotions. I never had a good day. I was always discouraged or disappointed. But, Lord, the outlook of my life is different. Why? Because of you, because of you, because of you. You did this for me. Lord, I love you. And all the while, she's within earshot of hearing them grappling at her while she's worshiping. That's when you know you're a true worshiper. And she's saying, Lord, I'm giving you this, but I wish I had more to give you. Because you're worth more than this perfume. You're worth more than this alabaster box. You're worth more than a car. You're worth worth more than a house. You're most worth more than all the money in my bank account. Because this is what you've done for me. She's not talking to him. She's not, uh, she's not worshiping him out of her need. She's worshiping him out of who he is and what he's done for her. Has she experienced the presence and power of God? That just goes to show you. See how easy honor is once you've experienced the presence and power of God? It marks your spirit, but it also marks your emotions. Huh? I want you to put yourself in her position because here's a woman. This is probably this is probably the most valuable thing she has ever had or will ever have. And yet she's brought it to Jesus and given it to him. Look at this next verse. Remember, remember what Jesus, uh, remember what John said? He said, Jesus was sent to his own, and his own received him not. I don't know about you, that bothers me. He was sent with a purpose from the Heavenly Father, who is the great giver, who is the increaser. And yet they didn't receive the gift that God sent them in the person Jesus. Amen. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. I think that says it all. What do you think? Again, ask the question, do I think like Jesus or do I think like Judas? You have to answer these questions as we go forward in time. You have to. My people perish for lack of knowledge. You're getting knowledge. Amen. Look at, the, look at this next verse. And Jesus said, let her alone. Notice how Jesus just let them keep talking. He just let them continue to gripe. He wanted to see how many of his disciples were going to join into the gripe session that Judah started. He's just letting them gripe, letting them gripe, letting them gripe. But finally, it comes to a tipping point. Says, Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble you her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for you have the poor with you always. In other words, just leave that up. In other words, you want to go help the poor? Go help them. Don't make a big hubbaloo about it. But that shouldn't affect what you do and how generous you are to the kingdom of God. You thinking that you helping the poor is the kingdom of God? It is not. It is not. And Jesus shows us this. For you have the poor with you always, and whensoever you will, you may do to them good, but me you have not always. And this is the, this is the, this is the problem then, it's the problem now. Oh, well, you know Jesus, he's always going to be around. That preacher boy, he's always going to be around. You know, and preachers, you know, they're preachers, they're just, you know how preachers are. 
they just take, they're just taking for granted. See, they take ministry for granted. They take the word of God for granted. They take the kingdom of God. They took Jesus for granted. They said, you aren't worth 30,000 bucks. And what do you think? Huh? What is, what is he showing us? And whenever you will, you may do them good, but, but me, you have not always. In other words, he's separating out these two things. Go and give to the poor. If that's something you want to do, go and do it. But you doing good to the poor does not mean you're being generous to the kingdom. Are you listening? Look at this next verse. Look at what look, look what this is. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world. See, Jesus wants to un- Jesus wants us to understand this, which is why he said this. Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. And this is the first time I've ever preached it in 25 years. But I knew I had to because it was alignment. Do you think this woman is known of in, in heaven? Do you think when she was here on earth doing this sacrificial gift to Jesus, do you think heaven knew about her? And he making sure that she's known for all time here on the earth because she was already known in heaven while she was here on earth. Huh? You want to be known in heaven? Be a great giver. Is it that the character and the nature of our heavenly father? But don't just give anywhere. You're going to see next week that we have a lot of outreaches that we give to, that this church, you give to. But we also, we have the understanding that when we give to the outreaches, we're not giving to the kingdom of God. Not unless they're a ministry. You listening? What the, what, the, what the Lord is wanting to show us is he's wanting to point, in, to point out the error of our thinking. He wants us to understand that the error is if we feel like we can be helpful to those people who are poor, but at the same time consider it a waste to give to the kingdom of God. That's the error of our thinking. Religious, for many, religious thinking has replaced the gospel. Religious tradition has replaced the word. It's just religious, religious tradition. And the religious tradition, what did Jesus say? What did the word say? It says, it's the power of God that has none effect. Amen. I mean, you're quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning. <laughs> Grab hold of this truth. Absolute truth. Sometimes that absolute truth, boom. Now, I want us to, I, I wanted to, I wrote this down, and I, I was telling the, the guys that were in the green room with me, I said, there's a section of this that I, I had written down and uh, I wanted to read what I wrote down because I don't want to deviate from it. Jesus wants us to understand about the error of helping the poor while disrespecting God because we put helping the poor above giving to the kingdom of God. He wants us to understand the value of respecting God in his kingdom because that's what God, that's what gives God access to honor you. Remember, If you despise him, you'll be despised. But if you honor him, you'll be honored. Amen. We despise, he said that we despise, being despised is opposite of honor. Isn't it? And that's what we've read in today's session. Now, you plant, you water, who gives the increase? God. God. God gives the increase. And so I have to settle that on the inside of me 
that I can't, I cannot increase myself. Now, when you build your faith that way, then every time you sow and plant, you'll pray over it. Every time you plant, every time you sow, and every time you go to water, how do you water that seed? You water it with the washing of the water of the word. You water it with the word. What, are, what, is the, what promise relates to that that I just planted, that I just sown? And then you look and you say, and you say to the Father, now, Father, you're the one that gives the increase to this. I planted it. I've watered it. I'm watering it even now as we speak. But I know it's you that gives the increase. Now, what are you doing? You're participating with him in supernatural increase. Now you're not limited to your job. You're not limited to welfare. You're not limited to your Social Security check. You're not limited to your 401K. See, there is no limitation because God's unlimited. Amen? Someone I heard, uh, br- someone told this Brother Copeland, and I've used it ever since. Someone said uh, he was praying for him. And he was praying for prosperity, and a bunch come up on him. And the lady inter- interrupted him and said, Yeah, but Brother Kobe, you don't understand. I'm on a fixed income. And he said, Well, let's unfix it. Let's unfix it right now. Unfix that. Where do you unfix it? Same place you fixed it. Now, what happens when you get increased like that, then you'll go, look at what God did. Oh, you just had an encounter with the power and the presence of God. Now, your emotions got caught up in that, and it'll say to you, well, you know what? If you did it once, can you do it again? Can you do it again? Will you do it again for me, Lord? He says, sure. I don't only have the ability to do it, but I will to do it, he says. When you depend on God, you're giving him honor. Amen. I was, we was working at Kenneth Copeland Ministries at the time. She had a, she, she and I both, we made a salary. But I had someone walk up to me one day. I'm not going to say who it is. I had someone walk up to me one day. And he said, if you had $50,000 to invest in a stock, what would you invest in? Now, this was back in the 80s. I told him exactly what I would invest in. This person went out and put $50,000 in that stock. That scare you? And they came back to me and said, yeah, I put $50,000 in that stock. Ten years later, this person came to me and handed me a $10,000 check and said to me, I made $850,000 on that investment. Now, that wasn't expected income. But then the Lord gave me other things that was far beyond my salary. In fact, there were times that I was making more money with these other things than I was at KCM on a fixed salary. That's a true story. And I could go down a list of things. The Holy Spirit would give me an idea, and I'd do it, and boom, there'd be $10,000, there'd be $20,000, there'd be $50,000, there'd be $80,000. Yeah. Why? Because he is the God of increase. He's the God of increase. But you can't be afraid of it. You got to sow. You got to water. Notice what James said. I got to read this. Uh, let me ask you this question while I'm about to read this. What value system do you value? Do you value the world system? Why would you want to? Why would you want to share in the world system the same system that Judas valued? Or do you value God's kingdom system? I think that answers. I think that answers its que- uh, the question on its own, doesn't it? I don't want anything to do with Judas or anything that he's involved in. James said, "But someone will say you have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith apart from your works. And James said, I will show you my faith by my works. It's not faith without works. You have to put action to your faith. You have to plant. You have to water. But your trust is, yeah, but God gives the increase. God gives the increase. Amen? That we get to prove whether we honor and respect God or not. We get to prove whether we honor and respect God's value system or not. See, by what we do. By what we do. Do we get anything out of this today? Oh, I can tell you're loving it. (laughs) I got the same response. Anytime you go talking about something like this, you get the same response from people. But I'm going to tell you, you get free from money, money will come running after you. It'll come, it'll come running after you. It'll chase you down. And it'll serve you. And you won't have to bow your knee like those uh, three Hebrew boys refused to bow their knee to that idol. And for many people, money's just an idol. Huh? That money system is just an idol. Say, I'm free. You said early on in this session you were ready. So you only have yourself to blame. Amen. Amen. Now, you're sitting there, and right there at eye level is an envelope called the vision offering. Like Kelsey said earlier, and like we've been saying for a month now, just ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you give in this offering next week. Now, we're going to share our past, what we, the, all the projects that we did last year, every project paid for. Amen. And we're going to share all of the outreaches we were involved with, all of the ministry that took place here, all the people that got saved, all the people that got filled with the Holy Spirit, all the people that got baptized in water, all the people that were ministered to and prayed over last year. And then we're going to forecast and show you what the Lord is having us do. We're also going to give you the vision I know it seems a little late in the year, but we're giving you the vision, the, uh, the prophetic word for this year that the Holy Spirit, already, we've already given you the first part of it, but I've, I've had the second part for now a while. So we'll be giving that next week. And then we'll be looking at what prophetic words the Holy Spirit gave us from 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and then 2024. And we're going to show you the thread of what he was saying to us throughout those prophetic words. Amen. We're going to show you the project that we're releasing our faith for for this year into next year. You're going to like it. It's going to bless you. It's going to benefit you. Everything that we do here is to benefit and bless the people of Path Point Fellowship Church. This is the flock that God has told us to shepherd here in Amarillo, Texas. Amen. And so this is what we're doing. Amen. And so ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you give. Now, you can, you can say this to me. Well, I asked the Holy Spirit, and he didn't tell, say anything to me. That's not true. He did. And if, he, if you don't think he does, make it up. And it's never zero. Give to the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, I've been the pastor, and the, uh, I'm, I'm the founder of this church. So there's a founder's anointing on me. That's very unique. Very few ministries can say they have a founder's anointing because they weren't the ones that founded it. But when the Holy Spirit several years ago began to talk to me about the founder's anointing and he began to share with me just the significance of it, how important it is, And then the anointing that's on it that assists the people that's a part of this work. It opened my eyes to something I had never seen before. But I'm going to tell you, as we share it going forward, you're going to be amazed at how it affects your life too. Amen. Sow into this and watch what God, the great increaser, the great giver, will do in your life. Amen. 
Go ahead and stand if you would. Hallelujah. We're going to have a few pastors down here and, and ministers down here at the front. When we go to dismiss, if you have a prayer request. If you have somebody on your heart and you know they're in dire straits and they need a miracle from God. Why do I say that? Because the Holy Spirit told me that earlier. They need a miracle from God to get them out of that situation. You want to come up and let one of these ministers pray with you about that. Amen. Tell that person next to you, I'm blessed. Tell them I'm the head. I'm above. I'm not beneath. My greatest days are ahead of me. My healthiest days are ahead of me. My most prosperous days are ahead of me. The best is yet to come. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This week, point someone to the path. You're dismissed.